Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for August 23rd, 2021. It's the time of week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff and I'm sponsored by Adafruit for my work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, we hold this meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel, but there are people around 24-7 in various channels to talk about Adafruit adjacent topics. Uh, this meeting typically happens, as it is right now, on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. We have a calendar to keep you up to date with the meeting time, so you can either view that online from the notes document uh, or add the link to your regular calendar app. Uh, in two weeks, we will have an exceptional meeting time due to the U.S. Labor Day holiday. Right now, it looks like we'll hold that meeting on the Tuesday afterwards. All right, this meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you prefer not to have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate, and we will be happy to read off your notes. The video will post up on YouTube, and the audio goes out as a podcast on various podcast services. If we're not on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. I mentioned the notes document. It accompanies the meeting and recording. This is where you leave your notes if you can't participate live, um, or hopefully leave them in any case. Uh, for people who are following along afterwards on YouTube. So if you're watching us on YouTube, there are timestamps in the notes document that will help you skip to the part that interests you the most. This meeting has tended to run about 60 minutes lately, so we understand if you want to skip around or not, join us for the whole time. A link to the notes document for the next meeting is posted to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pin messages to find the latest notes doc. The structure of this meeting. We will uh, have five parts in this meeting. Up next is community news, a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on a hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, where we take a statistical overview of the project. Then we get into the participatory parts. The third part is hug reports, an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, and to take the time to recognize the awesome folks around us in the community. Fourth is status updates, where we uh, take a few minutes to talk about what we've been up to and what we'd like to accomplish in the next week or so. And the fifth and last part is in the weeds. If we need a time for more long-term discussions, whether you've identified it ahead of time or it uh, comes to light during status updates, this is where we do them. Uh, add your topic to the end of the list and we will take them in the order that they are given. That covers how things we will go today. So I am going to switch over to telling you about community news. First up, JP's Workshop, the famous YouTube um, franchise, has reached 200 episodes, uh, which is a big milestone. So thanks for that. And uh, many projects have been highlighted, including those using CircuitPython. And of course, lately there's always a CircuitPython parsec to go with JP's workshop. Second, Whippersnapper. The beta continues. Whippersnapper is Adafruit's IoT solution using no code, and we're still in an invitational public beta. Here is one user's post from Twitter. I finally had a chance to try the Adafruit Whippersnapper beta. It took all of 20 minutes to hook my Funhouse LED to an existing feed from an air quality sensor. The LED now lights up when the air quality is poor. No code required. All right, but if you're feeling nostalgic, um, Todd Kurt has recreated classic screensavers in CircuitPython, both the famous flying toasters and the bouncing DVD logo. So check that out on Twitter. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure who the byline is, but it says whipped up a quick little 3D printed test jig for the Fibonacci 64 Nano using an Adafruit Cutie Pie, Pogo Pins, Perfboard, M2 standoffs, and CircuitPython code. And thanks to the links pasted in the Discord chat, I can tell you that is Jason Kuhn. All right, a video that I 
here over 100,000 people have watched, bad USBs are scary. Build one inexpensively with a Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython. Links to YouTube. And uh, we've, of course, featured that on the Adafruit blog. But don't be naughty. Don't be naughty with your USBs. Be awesome. Uh, last up, I submitted one to the newsletter this week. Um, I continue to work on the open source project Linux CNC, and I wrote up an article on using the Adafruit MacPad MacroPad as a control pendant with Linux CNC. Um, and that wraps up what I've extracted, but there is a lot more in the newsletter. So we invite you to subscribe by going to adafruitdaily.com and entering your email. That is a complete separate list from adafruit.com, so no spam, um, no marketing, just CircuitPython marketing. Uh, anyway, but it's also a community-run newsletter, and it's emailed out every Tuesday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython, and it always aims to highlight the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web. We want you to contribute your own news or projects, uh, so you can do that by editing next week's draft on GitHub and submitting a pull request with the changes. You can also tag your tweets with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Hope to see you and your project in there real soon. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Our kindly Adabot gathers statistics that cover approximately the last seven days and summarizes them, and then we give a little context to all of the numbers. So I will start with the statistics overall, which are any GitHub repo on uh, GitHub I think only those under the Adafruit organization that we identify as being related to CircuitPython and Blinka. So overall, we had 37 pull requests merged from 17 authors and 11 reviewers. So it's good to see those big numbers. And especially it feels like our author numbers are really, really nice lately. Um, so Peelzer and R. Pelvic are, or R. Pavlik, excuse me, are new or newer contributors. Um, and then we have a lot of the usual suspects. So thanks everybody. And if you're just getting started to contributing, we hope to see a lot more of you. Uh, issues wise, we had 35 closed issues by 18 people and 22 open by 16 people. Um, so it's good to see those issues numbers going down. Some of which, uh, Scott will tell you about when we move on to the core, which is up next. Hello. Okay, so for the core, uh, we had 24 pull requests merged from 15 different authors. So thank you to all of those authors, uh, as you said before. Uh, we had six reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. Um, as always, we're looking for more reviewers, because the more reviewing we can do, the more authors we can support. Of course, we love authors as well. Um, we have eight open pull requests, although I think this number's actually gone down since we snagged the stats. Um, and the oldest is 30 days old. Some of these are drafts as well. I wonder if we should get drafts in these. That would be a good idea. I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure that one of those two long open ones is a draft, and it's going to be that way for a while till well after 7 goes out. So it wouldn't right. hurt to uh, make and that I'd change. Like to, I, I would also like to say that if, if there is a pull request that is going to be a draft for a while, it probably shouldn't be a pull request. Um, you can still link to comparisons, like make an issue and link to the, you can you can make an issue and link to the branch that has work in it instead of a draft. Um, I'm kind of a stickler because drafts, they'll get counted in the top tab. Okay. And I use that, I use that as a metric for uh, how healthy a project is, keeping up with pull requests. So um, I think if, if there are uh, long-term things, then... Um, I think they're better served with an issue and a, a link to a branch. Um, but that's my my thinking. All right, well, um, we got a little off track there, but I appreciate the reminder. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, OK, so issue-wise, we had 24 closed issues by 10 people, so that's awesome. Uh, we had 15 opened by 10 people as well, so uh, we're net down nine. Uh, for a total of 423 open issues, this is uh, kind of a bit better than we have been, so that's awesome. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, closing issues. We have six active milestones where uh, the 700 milestone is kind of the one we're paying attention to the most right now. Um, 
that's the the milestone that we want to have zero open issues so that we can go to uh, doing uh, like a release candidate and then a stable release for 7.0. And that, ha that milestone has 18 open issues currently. Um, and there are uh, a lot of other issues, but we have four issues not assigned to milestone. Those are the ones that need to be uh, triaged as well. Uh, those are the highlights for the issue milestones. And then overall, uh, thanks to Jeff and Dan for grabbing bugs. We're seeing the issue count go down. Uh, beta zero is imminent, so please keep testing. And hopefully it'll be quick to go from beta to release candidate. Thanks, Scott. Next, I will invite Katni to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Jeff. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries. So that's everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few other repos, such as the Community Bundle and our Cookie Cutter. So we had 11 pull requests merged from four different authors. Uh, so thank you to whomever is putting in multiple pull requests and eight different reviewers. Um, we have now 48 open pull requests. Uh, in terms of issues, we had eight issues closed by eight people and five opened by five people, leaving us with 340 open issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests, open issues, and library infrastructure issues. Uh, you can search the issues to see whether there's anything you'd like to work on. Leave a comment and uh, let us know that you're going to work on it. Um, if you would like to get started reviewing, you can check out the open pull requests. Uh, if you have the hardware, test it. Let us know you did that. If you don't have the hardware and you want to just check it for syntax or spelling, etc., cetera, um, that's also uh, completely great because we miss those things as well. And um, you can leave a comment uh, and get started that way. And once you're comfortable with that, we can look at leveling you up to joining the actual review team. Uh, in terms of updated libraries or library updates in the last seven days, we have no new libraries, but there is a list of updated libraries, which you can find in the notes. Overall, we've taken care of updating all the guides and examples to work with the breaking changes we've made recently. Thanks to Foamy Guy and Lee Samurai Purpre for all of the amazing work done on this. Um, <clears throat> I'm continuing to see updates to both the Adafruit Circuit Python and the community bundles, which is great. And to everyone involved, please keep it up. And that's what I've got. All right. And to round out the section, Melissa will give us an overview of the Blinka stats. Hello, for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers, uh, we had two pull requests merged this week by one author and one reviewer. There are three open pull requests uh, still, and there were three closed issues by two people and two open by two people, leaving a net of 60 open issues. There were 8,575 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are still supporting 75 boards. And that's it. All right. And with that, we will move to Hug Reports. This section is uh, done as a round robin. So I will go first and then continue down the alphabet with Jerry and so on. And it's a time to recognize the people around us for the good stuff that they're doing keeping the community humming smoothly and building one another up. It's kind of an antidote to bug reports. Anyway, so I want to thank Dan for continuing to do release management and most importantly, write those release notes and issue a group hug. Uh, Jerry, what do you have this week? I have a thank you to Dan for the incredibly quick fix, diagnosis and fix of an issue that came up last night with the uh, NRF 5840 builds. Thanks. All right, Katni. All right, so I have a hug report for Ask Patrick W and Foamy Guy for staying on top of Cookie Cutter and uh, finding bugs and fixing those. To uh, Jeff and Scott again for taking over running the meetings for a bit while the outside of my building is ground off and replaced. To Les Samurai Purpre for finding more libraries that can and should be deployed to PyPI. To Foamy Guy for taking care of all the updates needed to deal with all of the breaking changes we made recently. To the community moderators on Discord, specifically Andon, for suggesting the idea of the help with the community channel on Discord, and Mr. Certainly and Andon for writing up the descriptive message to pin in the channel, and to everyone providing support on the Adafruit Discord server. It's amazing to see all the help provided. Um, 
there's always unread messages and jumping through them. Uh, it's great to see folks helping each other out and um, just everything being such a positive and supportive experience for folks. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Katni. Next is maker Melissa. Uh, hello, I wanted to give a hug to Tanu for helping me out uh, get up and running with the code editor setup, uh, mostly for like things that you wanted to see. Uh, I want to give a hug report to the Samurai Prey for working with on the Blinka Display I.O. and group hug to everyone else. All right, and next I have notes from Mark, who's lurking today, who has a hug from me and Dan for our comments and reviews of the PR on pin duplication checks. And now it's Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug to Andon, Katney, and the other mods for making a help help with community channel. I think that's really cool, um, and you all do a great uh, a great job moderating our Discord. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you to La Samurai Prepre for the wide variety of PRs and issues. Uh, very cool. They've started auditing the core as well as after having audited a lot of the library. So that's really awesome. Uh, hug report to Trevor for getting PyLeap into test flight. Um, I. I hope some of you are eager to try it. Uh, we'll, we will share it more broadly soon, hopefully. And then uh, last up, uh, again, a hug report to Dan for the great work on the audio stuff. The audio stuff is a huge slog. I've been there before, and uh, I really appreciate Dan taking a look at all of that. So those are it for me. All right, at the top of the alphabet, Dan is next. OK, thank you. OK, thanks to Jerry for finding the bug that I fixed on uh, last night. Uh, it's really good. I thought we had tested that version, but it wasn't true. And so I, I fixed that. Uh, and we're all set. And thanks for the Discord moderators, as we've already, as already mentioned. Uh, we've been dealing with threads being introduced into Discord, and we figured out how to deal with that, and revising some of the boilerplate material we have. And also thanks for adding the help with community channel. OK. All right. And uh, next, I have notes from Dave Brachetti, who says, Group hug, good to see you all. And then we come to Foamy Guy to round out the section. Hi. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, first hug is actually to you uh, for adding the auto feature to Circa. Um, I used that a few times this week and definitely really love how convenient that is. I'm not sure how we ever lived without that. To uh, GitHub user, I think it's probably D. Griswell. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correct. I apologize if not, but they updated Circup to be able to run a few of the commands without a device connected. There's some commands that don't specifically need a device, uh, but there was a check that was causing those to fail, uh, and they fixed that up. And lastly, uh, this week to Mark Gambler for reviewing my boundary fill PR again and catching a few things that I had missed and providing some really great uh, feedback on that. Thanks. All right, thanks to all of you. Uh, next, we'll move on to status updates. As I mentioned before, we would love to hear what you've been up to in the past week, what you hope to be up to until we have a chance to meet again. And the focus is on CircuitPython, but if there's something outside of that um, that you really just want to tell us about, please don't hesitate to. Uh, once again, I'll start and we'll go in alphabetical order. So uh, last week was mostly bug squishing. And um, because we were talking in our internal meeting about incompatible changes, um, I was reminded of a very minor incompatible change that I made two weeks ago. The display.refresh method does not throw an exception by default anymore. If Even if the time between refreshes was long, you can still get the old behavior if you wanted it. You just have to pass in the minimum frames per second value. And another bug I fixed, remember all those times we tried setting a lower IP? to C frequency to deal with a finicky sensor and it never helped. Well, it turns out that 100 kilohertz is the practical lower limit on the SAMD microcontrollers with our clock settings. So asking for a speed lower than 96 kilohertz now gets you an exception instead of an undefined speed on the uh, I squared C lines. This week is uh, gonna be more bug squishing. I don't know what all exactly. Um, and then coming up in the near future, I will be taking two weeks off. So uh, from August 30th to about September 10th, 
I will not be on Discord as much as I usually am, not responding to issues as quickly and so forth. So just keep that in mind. And uh, next up is Jerry. Thanks. I'm having have a nice vacation. Thank you. Um, so yeah, played around a lot last week with the with the um, OE 2640 stuff that, that Jeff has been working on for a long time and, and was porting it over to work on the Sayola ESP32 S2 board and um, had some some good success and some really weird stuff. So so I, I put out a, a new version. There is a, a nice demo that Jeff had done that runs on the on the Kaluga that let, lets you uh, use a, the OE2640 camera as a, um, a webcam going to the Adafruit I.O. And that worked really nicely, and it works nicely on the Sayola. Um, while I was working on that, I ran into some really strange stuff. And one of the problems I ran into is when I hook up a display, the ST7789 I've been using, I, I ran into some just strange problems that I'm still trying to diagnose and come up with a good example. But I kept the system would keep rebooting after a while. It wouldn't be stable at all uh, if I used the display. And, and that made it really hard to diagnose the next problem <laughs> because I, I'm, I find that sometimes with this sale, I get these funny captures that don't aren't right, but I don't know what they look like because I can't see them because I can't get the display to work reliably when the problem is occurring. What I do see is that when I send them to AIO, they are seem to be malformatted and AIO won't accept them. So I'll go into that when we get in the weeds um, in more detail and hopefully can make, explain it a little better. But it's just, just a heads up that there's some funny stuff going on there. It seems to only happen with the sale. I haven't seen that problem with the Kaluga. So I'm not really sure what's going on, but it's been interesting. All right. We'll talk about that in a minute, but for now we'll go to Katni. That's a long right. list, Katni. I know, it always is. Um, so I tested found bugs with last week, tested found bugs with an updated the MCP 9600 circuit Python library to work with the MCP 9601. Um, that involved updating the device ID. Pretty much everything else was, was identical. Tested the Arduino MCP 9600 library and found issues with that that were more resolved, uh, became intimately acquainted with the MCP 9601 addressing, address jumpering and pinouts. Um, there wasn't really very much clear information on it. And so to be able to figure out what was going on in the data sheet, I had to actually test it, um, which was annoying. But um, now I know what all of the address possibilities are for the 9601 and um, know exactly what the rest of the pins do. So I guess that's useful. Uh, and then subsequently published the MCP 9601 guide. I added MP3 playback to the MacroPad library following the core audio fix, started a new guide on MP3 playback on RP2040, which will include a MacroPad example and a Pico example. Um, the MacroPad page is done. The Pico page will be the MP3 essentials template, uh, which was on hold due to needing to order hardware, which I now have. Uh, tested some PRs, created the help with community channel and the Adafruit uh, Discord server and rearranged a couple other channels into the help with category on Discord and started the guide for the SCD 4X CO2 sensors. Uh, today so far, fixed the MacroPad pretty pins diagram and fritzing object. The STEMI QT connector was reversed on the fritzing object, which meant that the pretty pins one was backwards as well. Updated the basic BLE circuit Python guide to more clearly explain that you must have Bluetooth advertising code running on your board for it to show up in the BLE Connect app. It does not really fruit LE connect app. It does not simply show up with generic code running. Um, and then begin testing the SCD30 on Raspberry Pi. There's a forum poster that reports it fails after several hours, uh, which has yet to be clarified exactly what that means. Um, it's likely due to clock stretching, not working properly on Raspberry Pi. Um, tangentially related, uh, just for anyone, anyone's general information, the SCD41 and also the 40 in that case, seemed to run quite fine. I left it running for three days straight. So if you're wanting to do a long-term CO2 sensing project on Raspberry Pi, consider the SCD4X family instead. Uh, so the rest of this week, I need to finish the SCD4X guide, finish the MP3 guide, update the INA219 guide for the STEM QT revision. Um, also not added to this list because I forgot, but or not forgot, only found out about it in the meeting immediately before this is the um, hardware that I ordered for 
doing mp3 playback on the pico uh, doesn't have a guide so we need to do a guide for that but that guide won't go up until the um, mp3 uh, guide is done because i'm just going to mirror that example in there and not have to do a whole separate example for it um, and then look into what it would take to create an OBS timestamp shortcut key using Neo, Neo Key Trinky or the like on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Linux is already done. It's adapting it to the rest of it that I need to look into. And CircuitPython tangential from testing sensors for the guide. Either multiple CO2 sensors need to be calibrated or the levels in here are terrible. Uh, two separate sensors are reporting the about the same, so um, it's probably not the sensors. I sure open a window, exactly, but we're in the middle of a never-ending heat wave, and the, air, the AC barely, barely keeps up with the windows closed, and also there's construction outside my window. And finally, a general question to folks. Is anybody really good with Photoshop or some similar concept? Because I have a black and white PNG of a taco that I really need made to be higher quality than I have the skills to do. It's for a secret thing. Um, but if anybody is available to help out, uh, I just I'll, I can explain what I need done with it. But it's just not as high quality as it needs to be for the application that it's going to be used for. So that's what I've got. All right. Thanks, Katni. I'm sorry if it sounded like I was criticizing your your long list. Scott has it right. You do a ton. Anyway, uh, on to Melissa. Hello. Hi again. Hi. Uh, okay, so last week I finished updating the uh, Featherwing test for the Arduino EPD library. I worked on the new CircuitPython code editor interface, which took up a bunch of the time. Uh, and this week I'm going to finish up the new interface, or I want to finish up the new interface. Uh, then I'm going to work on the new 1.69 inch display guide, the one with the little rounded corners. Uh, I'll work on if I get that done, I'll then work on updating some EPD guides, and possibly I might try and uh, look at fitting some of the looking at. Let me repeat that. <laughs> possibly I might try and fit in looking at some of the Raspberry Pi issues in there, and that's it. All right. Well, Scott is up next, but seems to be working on his notes even as we speak. So uh, can you type and talk at the same time? I know you can. Sure. I, I realized I, I didn't actually talk about what I had done last week, so I thought I would add that. So uh, mainly last week was fixing USB on IMX, which happened to be a similar problem that we've had before, but I did it in a more general way. So we, we had checks where if you... We run background tasks and then we sleep and if a uh, background task gets queued between those two things then you can end up not running it for a long time which is bad so uh and usb is one of those things so i tweaked that um and made it so that we won't sleep if any background task is pending um and that includes usb and that fixes usb on the imx which is also the teensy uh there was a forum post about uh matching i squared c peripherals on the rp2040 that was like super easy to fix so i fixed that as well and then I did um, turn on Unicode file system or Unicode file name support on all boards. And I also tweaked the wrapper for strings that are Unicode so that they actually print out uh, the Unicode thing. So instead of seeing an escaped Unicode character for an emoji, you will now print out a emoji uh, directly instead. So that's what I did last week. Uh, this week is all about BLE for me. Um, I need to test PyLeap first and foremost, which is now in test light from Trevor. Uh, and then switching back to doing some tw slight tweaks on the on the APIs, including uh, being able to move files, uh, delete a folder with contents, and potentially tweak auto-reload as well. Because right now we, we reset immediately when you write a file, but that can be really annoying if, if the code or the client is trying to write like multiple files at the same time. So I think we should actually do uh, a cool down just like we do in, um, do the cool down that we do in USB for BLE as well, even though we know when complete files are written. It just, it'll it'll give the, the BLE client a chance to start another write before we reset the entire connection. So um, I think I'll, I'll probably do that this week too. All right. So, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Um, next up is Dan. 
Okay, I, I submitted a PR about, uh, which has just been approved, thank you, Scott, uh, to improve uh, handling of DMA audio buffers on SAMD processors, which was, I know more about SAMD DMA than I thought I had to know. So that's good. And I'm conti I'll am i continue to work on the rest of the uh, 7.0 issues along with the rest of the team. And uh, I've written draft release notes for 7.0 beta zero, and I hope to release that later this afternoon or this evening uh, after some, we're just waiting for some runs to finish basically. Um, so it should be out really soon. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next, I have notes from Dave Bricetti, uh, who says, I was trained this summer to teach the beauty and joy of computing. Uh, BJC.berkeley.edu is the website uh, to middle school students. One unit is about hardware, and I may adapt the, circ the curriculum to explore CircuitPython. And then once again, rounding out the section is Foamy Guy. All right. Um, for uh, last week, I uh, worked on new iterations of the boundary fill function uh, to address some of the feedback that came back in the PR. Uh, including uh, the new thing I learned was how to make an argument be optional inside of a core function, so that was fun to learn about. Uh, and I believe that everything that was mentioned in there is taken care of, and I think that that PR might be good to go, uh, but I'm happy to have another set of eyes if anyone else is interested in taking a look. Um, I finished up, uh, I believe, the rest of the breaking changes for CircuitPython 7, so I think we are ready to go there, but I'll be doing a final sweep uh, this evening. I looked into something that came up with PyLint on Friday. They, uh, they released a new version of PyLint Friday afternoon and it caused the actions to start failing, uh, but luckily the maintainers realized it and actually fixed it uh, sometime either later that day or early in the day on Saturday, so it did not become a larger issue for us. Um, I updated the dial widget to use the newest uh, Vectorio API, and I also moved it over to its own uh, new repo inside of the CircuitPython org. Uh, for this week, I'm going to try looking in to see if we can reuse the display shapes library to implement the vector IO API, uh, you know, in a way that's usable for Blinka display IO. So right now vector IO is in the core, uh, of course, and uh, we don't have anything analogous, I don't think, on, uh, on C Python for Blinka code. Uh, so I, I'd like to try to make that possible to use. And uh, I think the same thing will probably need to be done with some of the functions inside bitmap tools if we want to be able to use all the same stuff under Blinka Display IO. Uh, so I'm going to look into that. And then uh, I will also just be moving a couple more of the widgets out of the Display IO layout library over to new repos inside CircuitPython.org and adding them over to that newer, uh, newer bundle. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are ready to switch to our last section, In the Weeds, where in contrast to the last uh, few weeks, we've got several items. So um, first up is Scott. Hello. So not um, directly CircuitPython related, but I wanted to take a chance to ask uh, or talk about how we feel about Discord threads. Um, I'm kind of in the camp that I'd like to see them in more places. Um, although I know I know it's not on in all channels, but um, I think generally they're good, and I I think maybe when we're helping people with the help with channels, we should try to be more aggressive to use them, um, because that could potentially like allow us to to have more concurrent conversations for, in a channel, but also keep them better separated. Um, so, any other thoughts on threads, or or do we just want to? Oh, can you or Katni maybe give us an overview of where we are at with threads right now? Sure. So we enabled threads um, for, uh, well, okay. So threads were not, were supposed to be enabled by default um, on the 17th of August. Discord pushed that back, but we preempted them on the 16th anyway, because I wanted to have control over how we deployed them. And at the moment they are enabled in the help with, category and the live broadcast chat channel. Um, we did that for the purposes of sort of getting the feel for how threads were going to work, um, how moderating them would work, that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, that was part of what spawned the help with community channel. Um, because what we, so when we have moderation issues, 
uh, we typically would direct message the person who we needed to discuss it with. And then we would post a screenshot of that into our moderation channel so that all of us were aware of the interaction that was had. And what we're going to be doing from now on is using private threads. Um, and that way, all the moderators have access to the conversation. And it, we don't have to worry about DMing. We don't have to worry about um, you know, conversations getting missed, that kind of thing. Um, and the Help with Community channel is also, just as a tangential side note, available for questions about, um, like, if you don't know if you can post a link or you, you, know, you want to understand something like that better, that's what that channel is available for. Um, so in terms of threads, like, I, I feel like we're in a good place with them. I think, I, I, like I said, they're enabled across the board in the Help With um, channel or the Help With channels already. Uh, I I don't see a reason why we can't enable them everywhere, but I feel like giving it a little more time for us to just get a feel for it and for everybody to start using them is also a viable option. Awesome. Any other viewpoints? I found that things, it's harder for me to find threads that or find things that I need to reply to. Like I just found one that somebody had started a thread without posting anything. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the, in as a, it, it didn't turn into a thread. It was it started as a thread. So I'm just answering that now. But I, I think that these things are probably things that um, Discord will improve, I hope, mm -hmm. that there's some kind of UI fixes that can happen in the long run. I think in principle, it's okay. I think that it tends to narrow the discussion to only a few people kind of prematurely in some cases. So I'd just be wary. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't hold your breath about a UI update. The reason being um, threads in Slack are kind of terrible. <laughs> um, you don't know that there's been a reply to a thread. Like there's no notification about it um, unless you see in the list that the thread section is white but if you have scrolled down your list or your list is longer <laughs> than the thing that isn't anywhere you can see and you just have no idea that you've had any replies to a thread so my point is i think discord threads are already a little bit better than slack threads um which means i'm not sure that um i would expect a huge change yeah maybe that's true i mean they, they just more responsive to these kinds of things that's true. I, yeah, I, but I do think, I mean, I think if it, if we see that, I, I think it's you know I think it's worth trying. But I I would be, I I would like to figure out a way to have all the threads show up on the left hand side, all the ones that are active. Yeah, uh, there's an active threads thing at the top. That's for a single channel. Mm, oh, no. oh, I see what you're saying. There's just only two active threads right now that happen to be in the same oh. channel. Right. That's not. That's not really what I want. I want okay. like, I want them on the left hand side. Like if you if you're actually joined to it, like that's what I would like. Just and maybe maybe it's a matter of like getting a bot that just auto joins me to all the threads. <laughs> like, I would actually be okay with that. Um, yeah, like to just open open them all. Like see, yeah. Uh... Yeah, like I'd just like to see all the active threads on the left hand side. Instead of mousing over the thing, which doesn't even work all the time. Correct. Like yeah. Over it twice. Kind so. of what so. I started to do is like click the channel and then click at the top. There's like the threads button for the channel. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Sorry. That one of you should probably uh, put in a feature request. Right. It's just a thought because, I mean, talking about it is one thing, but <laughs> Discord doesn't listen to our conversations I'm so sure. yeah are you sure <laughs> no i wasn't um, gonna say that but i was thinking that scott <laughs> uh, anyway um discord if you're listening yeah so um, yeah I, i'll uh, add a to-do for myself i th i think we are currently in a good place um i know threads are on our radar so it's not like this is going to be forgotten um and we can look at enabling them further once we i think as a moderation team have a better feel for them. 
All right. Well, yeah. I'll maybe close this out with reading what Keith posted in the text chat, because I think this is an example of, yeah, we, we don't want threads in here. Uh, Keith writes, threads in the live broadcast chat might be tough for the broadcaster to keep track of the conversation, as they probably aren't free to click around and catch up on more chats. So intuitively, I agree with that. And so that shows that, well, we don't want to enable it 100% across the board. But anyway. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay waiting to enable it everywhere. I really, I, I wanted to talk about it also just to like get it on our radar as people who are like conversing a lot. And like, I would like to see us start to adopt threads for more things. Uh, particularly when helping people. So that, if anything, is the action item. If you're in a help with, consider opening a thread for the help you're giving. Mm -hmm. All right. With that, I will move on to Jerry's topic of the Sola and the camera. Okay post a couple of screenshots here or something or some stuff just to hopefully make this intelligible but I doubt I'll succeed um, what I've been doing is what what the cell or the AIO to um, the OV 2040 camera webcam does it captures an image and then it does this reformat where it goes to this v2a to base 64 and it creates this encoded data um, file that it sends to AIO and AIO says, ah, that's an image and it displays it. But what I'm finding is that sometimes when I turn on the board, if you look at the top, at the image on the top, the screenshot, the ones that begin with 9J, what it's showing you there is the first several characters of the encoded um, image. The ones that begin with the 9J work perfectly. They're, they're very nice. They show up just like they should. The ones that begin with the slash, 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 Y do not. And I have no idea why sometimes it comes up sending those and why sometimes it comes up sending the nine J's. And, you know, if I reboot it, that's what I did there. It, it fixes itself sometimes. And then, you know, once it's running, it'll run for hours and even days. But I, I, so I'm just looking to see, does anyone have any suggestions as to what to look at and what I haven't gone in and I, have to, I guess I really need to go back and decode the encode and see what it's getting so I don't know if the problem is in the capture if it's in the OB2640 if it's in it's not in transmission because I do I do dump the I did print out the beginning of the captured image the decoded captured image and it's that is what it's sending so it's not it's not a transmission problem so just curious if anyone's ever seen anything like this and has any clues as to what to do. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is I imagine you probably had to breadboard uh, this camera because there's not a camera connector on that board you're using. Right. Um, and, you know, I was dealing with the inconvenience of aiming no, the camera when it's attached to the Kaluga board. And so I put on, like, um, some of those male-to-female jumpers as an extender and when i did that my jpegs were often corrupted although they'd be corrupted in the middle like halfway down it would all change color or shift okay I've seen and that i took too. away i took away that like eight inch wire and then it was great so if it were an intermittent thing that affected i mean when it affected me it affected half of the images but you know like every other image or two out of three yeah. images yeah, uh, it's not that because, and I had similar problems at some point, but on the Kaluga, in fact, I put in a long, I've got about a, a 30 centimeter, yeah. you know, cable that I made and it's rock solid. Huh. Um, and on the, what I did find it seemed, at least when I first did it with the cell, uh, that if I touch things the right way, maybe it would change. Yeah. But, I mean, I was definitely uh, handling mine when I was seeing these right, problems. And so I suspect maybe it is a signal integrity thing. Um, and so... And so, uh, yeah, and and I would see some funny artifacts in in the display when I was getting working with the display. But again, I'm having a lot of trouble with the displays. So I'll keep trying that, trying things. But I'm just curious if this is anything like anyone has ever noticed. So 
Probably not, because I don't know if anyone's done this very much. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard from anybody but you who's tried this code, so um, that doesn't well, if anyone, mean... <laughs> if anyone uses that demo, they may run into this, um, depending on how you attach the... I tried swapping cameras. Um, I tried, I tried. you know, there's, there's a, a reset and a power down line that weren't being used. I tried using them, and none of that seems to make any difference. <laughs> I tried longer and shorter cables, and that didn't seem to make any difference either. Yeah, my my kind of gut guess is maybe it's picking up somewhere in the... It, it's not getting the beginning of the image, so it's getting the middle of the image, mm -hmm. but and why it would be this consistent pattern, yeah. that's got to be a if, clue. If it is a signal integrity problem, is the, the only solution is to make it shorter? Is there any, any suggestions for anything that would improve that? You'd have to ask an electrical engineer, not me. Okay, well, I just wanted to raise it. If anybody you know sees any issues and has similar complaints, it's probably correct. <laughs> but it's it's been fun to play with, and the, the webcam thing is really cool when it works. And I really enjoy it. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So probably even though you don't have it fully characterized, you should file a bug in the core. Um, if there's a fix, it's going to be in the core, I think. Oh, okay. So do feel free to file a bug, and then maybe someone will come along and say, I see so this where, too. Where in the core would you be looking at this? So this is in the, the image capture module. Okay. All right. Well, that's maybe... All right. And that, and then so I also played around a lot with the QR one. And again, it and it works fine, except that it's really hard to do the QR codes if you don't have a display. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you, you don't know where the thing is looking. And so that's when I tried putting display on, and then I started running into problems. So... I, I need to understand and resolve that issue as to why I can't get the displays to the display to work properly. Did um, you have any trouble, any similar trouble with displays on the Kaluga? I think so. Okay. Um, you know, I haven't characterized it. It's not not nearly as bad, but I but I am having an issue with the Kaluga as well. And I'll, that's I'll, I'll, I'll again if I can come up with a good demonstration of it, I will certainly put it put it out there. Um, and the the symptom is spontaneous reboots that aren't safe mode. Yes, it just reboots and comes back up, you know, and tantalizes you with Circuit Pi for a couple of seconds, and then you, by the time you try and do something with it, it goes away. <laughs> um, there is an issue that's very similar to that. It involves Wi-Fi and importing some other modules, and uh -huh. the relation between, you know, just what the module is is unclear. But that's one of the bugs that's blocking seven O. And oh, I okay. so looked at it for so a couple of really days without figuring anything out. So this may be the same bug, just slightly mm -hmm. different circumstances. So okay. In fact, now you mentioned, I do remember seeing some traffic about the spontaneous reboots. So these may be totally independent issues or, or, or different issues. I mean, this that may just be a uh -huh. seven six. Has it happened when you weren't using Wi-Fi? Because I guess both of these uh, examples I, I, are using I, I, Wi-Fi. On these things, so. Yeah. Well, actually, is that true? No, the the QR one. Well, the QR one uses Wi-Fi in in one incarnation. Right. You know, I've been using Wi-Fi for that. I'm trying to think if I just set up the camera. So if I'm just running the camera, I don't think on the Kaluga I've had it happen. But all so yeah, I think it has probably only happened when I've had it using Wi-Fi. Uh, not so on this on the cell though, because that one I have have had it running. Yeah, that one will just run for a while, then the then the screen will just go blank, and hmm. it won't necessarily reboot. It just won't show anything. Um, yes, yeah, so it seems to be different, maybe different issues there, but that's a good good thing to look at. Uh, so you. in the text chat, Keith asks, "Is that reboot yeah. something that takes place at a consistent time, like after the same length of time?" The I one don't... that I was looking into was as soon as you asked it to connect to Wi-Fi, or soon after, before it returned from connecting to Wi-Fi, it would restart. And if you could get the debug information from the, the debug UART header, it would indicate that it was a watchdog timer problem. And uh, I can find the bug link after the meeting if anybody's still interested in, in looking into that. I'll have to go back and look through the timing as to when, when mine was doing it. It wasn't overly predictable because um, it would seem like I would sometimes get a couple of images out before it rebooted. Um, but uh, I'll... 
lots of things to check. Okay, I was just hoping uh, to go. Uh, I asked because I'm working with the CO2, the uh, SDC40, and I'm getting a reboot at a very consistent length of time. And so that time period is exceptionally consistent. It will reboot. And what I only know it. Uh, I was actually trying to get the code to figure out the time period. Uh, zooming in. About twice a day? Uh, no. Or no, less uh, often. Those aren't every day. Uh, this is the wrong image. This is a more zoomed in timestamp. Um, okay, so there's, there's your day, I'll, day, month, day, hour? Um, that would be correct, month, day, hour. I'm going to, uh, I'll turn off the microphone and pull up some code and try and get that time delta narrowed down to the number of hours or minutes. But it's so consistent in my issue that I was wondering if it's related. Okay. Yeah, uh, for me, mine's never run that long, so <laughs> um, that would be a considerable victory if it made it that long. But um, that's really interesting. Okay, I'll grab some more information for it after this then. All right. Thanks, Keith. Uh, next up, we will head to Fummy Guy's item. All right. Uh, I was asking about the uh, system that bundles the code for projects inside of Learn. Um, specifically, what I'm interested in understanding is if it's able to pull from like the community bundle and CircuitPython org bundle uh, and perhaps others. Uh, because before I remove the, uh, specifically, I think icon widget is the one that's in there. But before we remove the rest of the widgets from the display layout library, uh, I, of course, I want to definitely make sure that the project bundler will still be able to find them so that the existing project that uses it, uh, I think the Steam Deck is the only one, um, but there may be others I haven't specifically checked, uh, but I know that one for sure. Uh, you know, we definitely want to make sure that we'll still grab all the correct libraries and everything for folks um, once we move that over. So that code is not public. Um but I can definitely get you info and probably put you in touch with our dev that worked on it. Um, and then we can make sure that either we update the bundler to do what we need it to do, or we work that particular repo around this particular issue. Cool. Sounds good. So I will uh, look into that and let you know. Awesome. Thank you. And as you may already know, Fumi Guy, there will be changes needed for the screenshot maker to get things from the other bundles, as far as I'm aware. Uh, yes, I think you're right, probably, because uh, it's I think it's hard coded to look at the one JSON file from the main bundle, so it will probably need to grab a couple yeah. of those. It also occurs to me, it would be really nice if there were some code that was shared between CircUp and the screenshot generator and the learn system so that we knew there was one source of truth. We know that the learn system is going to do things with it that are going to remain part of the private source, but maybe there would be a way to structure it so that we could share the same code to enumerate the files so that we knew it was consistent. Um, so I don't know if that's anything that would be on the table, but you might want to talk about that when you have a chance to chat with them. Okay. Does that make sense, Katni? It does. Um, I. If I remember correctly, whether or not you came to it separately or not, it is running similar code. They're um, they're both using find import and then some yeah. other stuff. But um, that may have just been coincidental. <laughs> um, but no, I follow, and I think it might be possible to um, to. I mean, I, I guess I don't know. I'm just I'm just saying things, but it might be possible to make the the bit that does the bundle um, public and then have that be be able to be shared amongst multiple things um, versus obviously there's, you know, stuff on Learn's end that is part of Learn, but I don't think, I think it would be feasible to have, to have some shared code. Mm -hmm. Although some of that, that might not be in Python at all. I don't know what Learn, what languages Learn is written in, although there must be some Python, but yeah, I, yeah. 
I hope that we can find a way to, yeah, do do the most sharing while keeping what Adafruit, you know, may, considers part of the private parts of Learn still private. So you're talking about shared code across the bundler and the screenshot maker? Bundler, screenshot and, maker, and, and Circup. Circup, okay, that was Because those all, right. all three have different ideas about, I mean, not conflict, not deliberately conflicting ideas, but they have kind of different grasps of this information about what do you need to put on the drive for it to work, because they're all independent. Yeah. So okay. it would be maybe a module if, especially if Learn is using Python and all of the adjacent stuff, it's something that you could import and you would just say, here's my, here's my directory. It's got a code.py in it. Tell me all the things. And then, you know, Circup could maybe use that for Circup auto and the mm -hmm. screenshot maker would use it so that they would agree on which file extensions to include. And I don't know, I don't know what all, but sharing code so that we are guaranteed we've got the same information coming from these three similar but different sources would be for the best. Okay. I'm making notes. Thank you. And if I can spell. Um, <laughs> all right, so got it. I will bring this up with Justin. Um, and I will uh, see whether, uh, Foamy Guy, whether I can put you in touch uh, with him directly, or I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sure I can. Um, but obviously, I need to talk to him first. Um, and uh, we'll see what we can do to get this sorted out. Because I. I imagine adding the other bundles to the bundler probably isn't that big of a deal, but if we're going to be sharing, if we're going to try and like extract this code for sharing purposes, um, it may be something that somebody else can work on other than, other than Justin, um, which may be able to make it more extensible, uh, quicker. Cause obviously there's somebody can focus on that versus Justin focusing on many things. Okay. Sounds well, good. Thank you. Tim, you, you knew all about, uh, find import because you wrote the image thing, right? I learned a little bit about it. I would not necessarily <laughs> say I know all about it. <laughs> well, I, I'm just thinking you might be up to writing the code at least to share between Screenshot Maker and Circup. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, I'm definitely up for that. In in terms of your, your knowledge and comfort level. So just to... Yeah. Yep, yeah, definitely something I would be up for. Okay. Uh, well, that I think concludes our last in the weeds topic. So I am going to wrap up this uh, meeting. It has been a nice hour spent with all of you. The Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for August twenty third, twenty twenty one. Thanks to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python and uh, people like me who work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting is released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast is available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on August 30th. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. If you want to get notifications about meetings or be able to uh, speak during the meetings, uh, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>